But no, um, this book of the Hebrew Scriptures, it, uh, it's the last one in the Old Testament. It's the last prophecy uh, around 400 or so B.C., some sort of 420 B.C. This is not too far after in terms of sequence um, the book of Nehemiah. Right? And it's, it's not that far after that uh, in terms of the layout and the time periods and whatnot. So that gives you some perspective uh, to consider. You know, in this, uh, this book, Malachi, you don't see the name Malachi utilized really in any other text in the Bible, you know, in, in the Hebrew scriptures or whatnot. The word, it just simply means um, my messenger. Malachi means my messenger. Some people try to, uh, other scholars, people that study this stuff, try to uh, insert that maybe Ezra wrote this book. That's maybe a stretch. Um, some say, some people say, as far as an angel or something to it, wrote this book. Uh, we could presume it's just a guy named Malachi. It'd be okay, you know. <laughs> That's always a good way to go. You know, I've often heard it, heard it uh, likened to, and it's a good way to liken to. And so, you know, if you were to receive an urgent letter in the mail, like overnight to you via FedEx, you know, you probably wouldn't sit there and study the FedEx person real heavily and try to figure out you know, his name, his history, his you know, ancestry. You would just be like, give me a letter. You know, it's an urgent letter. You just want the message, right? So that's, that's kind of the way we take, take it in, uh, if you will, as we look at this thing here tonight. So um, we'll read Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. Sorry, I think it, right. it says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. It says in verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord, and yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob I have loved, I'm going to just go ahead and read verse 3, but Esau I have hated, and have laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Now write down and this may be, you know, something just to a note for yourself, that there's basically seven uh, questions apparently the people have asked God in the book of Malachi. And we're going to look at three of those tonight. Um, one of those is, you know, Malachi 1 and 2, in what way have you loved us? We'll see in 1 6, in what way have we despised your name in 1 7, in what way have we defiled you? In uh, chapter 2, verse 17, in what way have we wearied him? In chapter 3, verse 7, it says, in what way shall we return? In chapter 3, verse 8, it says, in what way have we robbed you? And then in uh, chapter 3, verse 13, it says, in what way have you spoken against We Have we spoken against you? See, there are questions that are lingering in the people's minds and hearts, if you will, that God is addressing in this book, you know, as we're looking at it together. And, and keep it in mind, the time period being, you know, after the, this is almost 100 years, not quite, but maybe around 100 years after the temple was built and completed with Ezra, and then just 24, 25 years after Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, the temple walls. So shortly after, things have been somewhat established, reestablished, if you will, people being brought back in from Babylon, they've got a little bit of familiarity, you know, uh, 100 years goes by, that sort of thing takes place, or is... Uh, you know, it happens, this familiarity. And it's interesting, you know, as you jump into this book, it's one of the notes I forgot to hit on. Um, I didn't count to see this myself, so if I get this wrong, please forgive me. Um, but it's said that there's 52 verses in the book of Malachi, 47 of the verses being God speaking in the first person. Like God to say, you know, obviously Genesis, Revelation, Luke is the word of God, but in terms of it being like God says X, you know, that's that's a lot more than any rest of the Old Testament books combined. Uh, you know, God speaking in the first person, as we see there. So God essentially is answering these doubting questions. You know, if I was going to give a title to this message, you know, I'm picking up here again in just a minute, in verse uh, that we left off there in verse three. You know, I would I would say these were be uh, symptoms of a person becoming lukewarm. Symptoms of a person becoming lukewarm. You know, very much in a similar way, if you follow the line in the New Testament, you know, I like using Ephesus as an example.
example because I actually wrote a paper on <laughs> this, this storyline. But you know, you see, you know, in uh, Ephesus, you know, in Acts 19, where Paul's leaving that church, uh, he's poured his heart out to the elders and warning them and whatnot. And then, you know, later uh, Paul writes the letter to the Ephesians. And then, less than a century, probably less than 50 years, we see Jesus. In the New Testament, this is supposedly after, if you want to say, the church was established and being synonymous with the temple being established, the New Testament comparison there. You know, he's, he's warning them of them losing their first love. And so you see some of these things. God's kind of indicting this, uh, the people that have gotten sort of a familiarity. You don't see some like, you know, cataclysmic sin per se. You know, we see it leading down that direction, sort of, a, you know, sort of an ebb and flow, just a routine of things. Start getting to uh, a point where there's a frivolity involved in their service toward the Lord, and so we see that. So this first question that we see here in verse two, it says, "I have loved you," says the Lord, and the people say, "Yet you say, in what way have you loved us?" And God draws out the nation's origins, really, the, the relationship he had with Jacob, who's kind of the father, as you will, of the nation, right? Um, was it not Esau, Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated? No. When we see there's a mystery, if you sit back and just think on it, of why would God love Jacob? I mean, if you just without knowing on the surface, if you just read through the accounts there in Genesis, not knowing, you know, immediately the promises that God had centered around the nation of Israel and around Jacob, this calling, the stuff that God had put on Jacob's life, um, and the, the seed of the promise following Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you didn't know any of that, and you just looked at some of the behaviors, if you just extracted some of the behaviors, the manipulation, right? You see that, the swindling, you know, he, he tried to lie and cheat to get the, the blessing, you know, and it's sort of a haphazard way. And it's like, man, that's, that's crooked. You know what I mean? We just look at that and say, that's, that's messed up. But yet, there's this calling of the Lord upon Jacob's life. And I do think, as we look at this, and I want to pick this apart just a little bit, these two things, this um, Jacob I love, Esau I hated uh, a little bit more. But I think there's a bottom line that we can understand if you read these accounts of these stories. <laughs> and the bottom line is that Esau, you know, was given his birthright. He was the first one. There was the two twins struggling, right? The, mo the mother of, uh, what was it? I forgot her name. Was it Rebecca? No, it wasn't Rebecca. Isaac's wife? Yeah, Rebecca. All right, I'll run the money. Yeah, that's like I was saying. No, but, <laughs> but no, there's this struggling in the womb, you know, and, and she said, man, I feel like there's, there's in, and there was a thing that was you know, going in the womb. It says two nations struggling in the, in the womb. And uh, Esau comes out first. That was sort of weird. Then I'll get into the whole story. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that we see Esau was first in birth from the two twins. And we see that there was that moment in time. You know, there was the growing up of these guys. Isaac had a special love for Esau. You know, there's his heart was endured toward Esau. Uh, Jacob's, you know, Rebecca was inclined to Isaac. And we see Jacob strongly, somewhere on the line, he strongly desiring this blessing. Or at least his mom threw him desiring this blessing from God, right? You know, she was willing to kind of set him up to, to get the blessing because she loved him. And some of that maybe mirrored into his heart where he really desired it. I mean, he ended up going down to where later on in his life he would wrestle with God. He would get in the octagon with God. I mean, you know, that's like the last thing you do if you're an untrained fighter. Get in the octagon with the supreme creator of the universe, you know, and I think you're going to win a wrestling match. But, you know, at the end of it, he's like, I want to bless you. I think that God saw that within Jacob, that strong desire to, to crave or covet the blessing of God, even though it was you know, misaligned the way he came about it. And yet he saw the flip side. I think the bottom line is pretty easy to see. He was willing to throw out the window, the birthright. You know, maybe he just thought, well, I'm the oldest, dad loves me anyway. And whatever, it's just you, Jacob. 
birthright, whatever. Maybe he thought he was going to be getting it anyway, you know, just because he, he was in good with that. But he, 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 there was a shrivali towards the blessing of God. And, that, and in that day, I mean, you know, you know I'm not think as much now as this time, but in that day, I mean, there was a great gravity centered upon the, you know, the, the inheritance that was to be given, that blessing to the firstborn. It was to be like a double portion. We knew that from Scripture, Hebrew Scriptures. We knew that from, you know, plus the traditions of the day. But we knew that, that basically all the responsibility was going to go to the, the oldest son. And he treated it lightly. So when we look at this, people get into the concept, and we'll look at some of the sections of Scripture, a couple of them. But people look at these things and they tend to just, you know, get really up into the argument of this thing called God's election. And, you know, God's foreordained certain people and there's certain people that are not foreordained. And we'll look at some of these verses and hash out a little bit. But I think it's sort of like, I mean, when you start looking at the spiritual baseline of the examples God uses, Esau and Jacob, I don't think it's too hard to see that, you know, this guy's heart is really not turned toward the Lord. So we'll look at this couple of things real quick. You know, first one, Jacob, I have love. You know, if you introspect, if you think, like I said, about Jacob, and you see his life, some of the things in his life that were messed up, there should be a question more along the lines of, why did God love Jacob? <laughs> why did God love Jacob? And, you know, in the same sense as we introspect as followers of Jesus, if you look at the commandments, this is always a good thing to do from time to time. And you look at the gravity of our stance before the Lord without Jesus. If I look, if I chalked up on a, you know, if there was a board big enough for me to put it on, you know, every lie I've ever told, you know, and I just threw it up there on the board. Every little deceitful, twisting thought that I've ever had that was kind of like a sway of the truth got thrown up on the board, just chalked up on the board. Every lustful thought I started ever had in my life just got thrown up there. Every time that I thought something hateful towards somebody, you know. And I know you guys don't ever think that way when somebody cuts you off in traffic. You don't ever have this imagination that, what if you just hit a nail and start spinning out, flying in the media, and like, ha, 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 and start laughing. That's, all, that's not me. But <laughs> maybe some of you had that thought. But just, you know, these things that go on in our head. I mean, if you're in America, you've probably got some crazy, crazy, crazy thoughts. Probably more than any other human beings have ever had. With the exposure of media and the exposure of, well, now social media and, and uh, your phone being right there at your hand. I mean, you can literally look up anything and, and, and visualize it even. Except for this Bible study, because I don't want to go up to TV. But, you know, but, 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 you know it's, 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 there's a lot of stuff in there. If we were honest and we, we looked at each one individually and thought to ourselves, what if I got the absolute justice of God for that one action? And you start adding that. You start multiplying it. You know, you, you're going to look back and like, why does God even put up with me? If we're real honest, I mean, I think that some days <laughs> I'm up there wondering, am I supposed to teach? And I think I am. I teach you. Know? <laughs> this is God's choice. What's going on? But it's the amazing love that He's bestowed upon us. Because somewhere along the way, there was a mustard seed of faith in your heart towards towards the gospel, towards Jesus, and then you chose to respond to that. I mean, that was your faith with response to it, and and, then, and that love. Of God is poured out upon you. That favor of God is poured out upon you, just like it was poured out upon Jacob. <coughs> and this thing, you know, Esau that I've hated. You know, there's uh, some people look at this. I looked at the, you know, I'm like trying to rip words apart and try to find things. But you know, the essential Hebrew word for hate there, it can the connotation can lead to being seen as loved less. There's uh, examples in Genesis 29, 31 through 33, if you want to read that or note that or write that down, or the exchange with dealing with Leah, you know, Jacob's wife, the, the, the comparison there of her seeming hated. Now, I mean, you know, I mean, he had kids with her, like a bunch of kids with her. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's the idea that there's a love less, 
you know, in comparison. Also in Deuteronomy 21.15, which actually speaks uh, specifically in the law. I've talked about it once from the platform and there on Thursday, slightly referenced it. But you can read that text, Deuteronomy 21 verse 15 and the verses underneath of it. Actually God speaking about what to do in a situation if a man ends up having an extra wife. And one's loved less or hated. That word is used, same word we use here in uh, the Hebrew text here. Um, what to do, and it actually, in that context, actually says that the, the hated wife actually had the first son. He should be treated as the firstborn. Even if you don't like her as much or love her as much. So that was prescribed there in God's law. Not condoning, but just in response to knowing that you're a bunch of sinful wretches. <laughs> you need some guidance on this stuff. But, uh, you know, so there's that there. Uh, Matthew 6.24, there's in the New Testament the comparison of masters, loving one master versus loving another master. Luke, uh, let's see, John 12.25, he who uh, hates his life in this world is, is used as a comparison there. You know, if you love your life, you lose it. If you hate your life in this world, you'll find it. Is the idea of loving your life less. It's not just sitting there beating yourself up and doing crazy stuff to yourself or thinking suicidal thoughts. Yeah, I hate my life or something like that. It's not that. It's by comparison. You know, you love your life less versus the kingdom. And then Luke 14, 26, this is one you've probably heard. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, and yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. This is not obviously telling you, this is not a contradictory to the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. Now Jesus says, hate them. You're like, oh, some people are like, I'm already three steps ahead. All right, hate my mom, hate my dad, hate my wife, hate my kids. It's great. Follow Jesus. No, it's not what I'm saying. You know, it's by comparison. You know, by comparison, your love for him is supreme. And, and, and towards him, compared to, to them. And actually, if you're supremely connected to the Lord, you will in turn love your wife and love your spouse. Actually, in Malachi chapter 2, God ends up using that as an example. As is like saying, you don't even take care of your, you don't even take care of your first relationship with your wife. That's, that's another study next week. But So there's that kind of, that's that comparison. We do see it in Romans 9, 11 through 18. It's sort of a bulky passage. This thing of calling an election mixed in. God throws another example at us here. It says in verse 11 of Romans 9, it says, For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. This is where you get the calling and election stuff. And it says, verse 12, it says, it says, Before they were born, before there was any good or evil, so there was a decision made. The verse 12, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. That's to Rebecca, using this uh, scenario we discussed. Verse 13, as it is written, and this is Paul quoting uh, the scripture here in Romans, verse 13, chapter 9, verse 13, it says, as it is written, Jacob, I love, Esau, I hated. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and on whom he wills he hardens. And if you remember, we went through this uh, study in Exodus. There was the first few chapters, the first few instances, there was the, the phrase that here Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then we see in the last plagues following, God confirming this hardness of heart. God is confirming. God's agreeing with Pharaoh. God's meeting Pharaoh where he decided to be at. And there's a crossover further on in the New Testament that I think is important for us as believers in this day. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. Speaking of the Antichrist, uh, when he comes on the scene a little bit thereafter, it says, And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth, 
but have pleasure in unrighteousness. You know, when a person decides not to believe, when they decide not to believe, they're making themselves more susceptible to the delusion that will fall upon all men on planet Earth. It's not necessarily a step forward. You know, sometimes, you know, you hope, you know, the statistics play out. What is it? You know, they say in America's heard the gospel seven times, or only seven times, you know, you respond to it. But, you know, in the Bible, when we look at this, we see Pharaoh, you know, God affirming him in his decision. We see, in a sense, in the future, you know, time period, people that are not accepting Christ now. When the Antichrist shows up, when delusions, you know, or the strong delusions, what the Lord says here, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, that, they're, that they should believe the lie. They're going to believe and fall into lies the more that they don't choose to step in and believe in Christ. They're more susceptible. When you think of Pharaoh as the example, you look at those plagues, man. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, this calling election. I mean, I think, you know, again, I think it's calling election thing. I don't mean in any way to treat it lightly. I believe what God says. The rest of chapter 9 talks more about that. But, I mean, Pharaoh, I mean, come on. I mean, he's like, the counselors of Pharaoh are like, look, dude, let these people go. You know, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, they're like getting, you know, it's complete darkness over here, sunshine and flowers over there in the ocean. They're like, you know, <laughs> what? You know, the, 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 the hills smacking down, they're smashing their cattle. And a few of the Egyptians were like, well, let's put the cattle inside. You know? it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I want my, kid, my dog and cow to smash. I mean, and, and it's so evident. But he's deluded by what? Pride. Power. He's believing a delusion. And unfortunately, there is a thing for people that don't repent. And, and I can see the easiness of this. The people are so easily in our culture in this day and age. You know, a, a catastrophic event happened here. Some systems implemented there to, to pretend to prevent that. And all of a sudden they lose autonomy, they lose control. And they're deluded. I mean, it's, I can see the ease of that happening, right? Now, this is my bottom line statement on this when we move through the rest of the text. Um, what are the things that help us prevent walking after the way, if you will, Esau? And I think it's very simple. I think Esau is just simply a picture of the flesh. You know, his base desire. It wasn't like, you know, he had this tantalizing idol. You know, here he saw go chase the idol. Woo! You know, he just ran after it. It was just like a base desire that all normal people have. I'm hungry. You know what I mean? Get out of my way when I'm hungry. Don't talk to me when I'm hungry. I might get angry when I'm hungry. You know what I mean? There's those normal things in the flesh. And he desired the, the things of the flesh. More than his identity. More than his call to be the his birthright. And I think that's the lesson. Romans 13, 12 through 14. It says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. You know, Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 14, for all things are lawful for me. It's, it's, it's okay for me to do this or do that, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach, stomach for foods, but God will destroy both of them. Now the body is not for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And both God has raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. There's that dependency upon the Lord that causes us to want to be disciplined from things that may be a proclivity to us in the flesh. I don't know how that plays out for each person. I don't. I mean, there, there probably are some things that, that would be beneficial to you. Like Paul said, I'm not going to be brought under the power of anything. Maybe the Holy Spirit has something that, you know, through confirmation to your wife, maybe through confirmation to another brother in the Lord, through confirmation in your own mind, is something that you know what you need to abstain from X. 
whatever X might be that is maybe it's, you're under its power. Okay, that's another way of putting it. Paul said, I want to be subject to the power of any. I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it's stopping certain things in your diet. I don't know. But there's something that we want to be disciplined on as disciples of Christ. Like we're athletes. You know, Paul uses that example also in the New Testament to encourage us in that mind, to, in that mentality. And, and feed him. You know, life lessons just don't feed the flesh, but feed the spirit. Feed your call in Christ. Not that Esau, but the Jacob, right? Uh, verse 4. It says, even though Edom has said, and Edom is ultimately the descendants of Esau, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. So God's judgment continues to carry on to these uh, the Edom. In Numbers 32, 23, your sin will find you out. The consequence of sin will follow through, follow through, follow through what happened. Verse 5, it says, Your eyes shall see, you shall say, The Lord is magnified beyond the Lord of Israel. Now, um, we do see later in the New Testament, um, Herod, with many of the stuff I've read, many scholars think that Herod, the uh, Tetrarch, the guy that helped, you know, send out the killing of uh, the newborn, or, you know, two and under, was a descendant from, from uh, part, partly from, Edom was renamed Edomia, pronounced with an I, and he was born from that line of Edom, and that Herod's from the last of uh, the Edomites that were destroyed. So we see that destruction that will be thrown down, territory of wickedness, the indignation of the Lord forever. You know, I do think there's a lesson in that. And it says, Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord is magnified beyond the Lord of Israel. I think there's a lesson in being able to, you know, God talks about earlier with Saul that, you know, Jacob and I have loved and Esau have hated. There is a lesson to be learned in seeing the finality of judgment against people that walk after the flesh. You know, I think it's sort of a spiritual bottom line when we look at that. There's a lesson to be learned. There's also a lesson to be learned, I think, in the sense that 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 we can take in and, and receive from God in, in, a, in a positive way that, that I'm loved. I'm loved. I'm not going to end up in that category on the day of judgment because I'm in Christ. You know, I'm loved by looking up and seeing the judgment of God take place against sin in the world. There's an encouragement we can take, not against them and saying that it's, you know, well, that's bad and it's terrible, but we can take an encouragement knowing that I'm not on that path. You know, it's like those, um, you know, it's, there, there's encouragement in knowing that you know, if you see and start counting the benefits and the blessings that you have because you're in Christ. If you look at Ephesians 1 and just read through that text and, and see all that has been done for you. If you start looking and seeing that consequence like I talked about earlier, you start seeing the, the depravity and the justice that you deserve. But then you look to the cross and you see the Lord and you see His mercy. That His blood has cleansed you and wiped all that away. And you let that ruminate in your heart through the Holy Spirit for a little bit. You know, you start to be more appreciative toward God. As you're counting, and then you count your blessings that are in Christ, the things that you, you, you get that are from Him. The blessing and benefit of walking in the promises of God. You know, you start weighing that in. You start weighing in if you're really connected. Most, I think most of you men are in some way, shape, or form connected to being in fellowship with God's people. So, <laughs> Start, start reeling from the testimonies that we receive from one another that I hear from you or I hear from you as you share or, or interact with one another, that you start compile, putting that on to the blessings that you've received in Christ and it's just like there's a sense of mutual encouragement. Those are, those are blessings. You start realizing you love the love of God. The life lesson I was put is to count your blessings, being thankful in all things and remembering what the blood of Jesus has purchased for you. This is, these are huge, huge things. As we consider the Lord, even in His judgments, 
Now verse 6. These are uh, some more questions that pop up. It says, The son honors his father and the servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am the master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. To you, priest, despise my name. Yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? So God's saying, Where is my honor? Where is my reverence? And the people are saying, In what way? Have we despised your name? And I, I like, God just uses the comparisons. You know, he uses the examples for us to look at. As a son honors his father, this was just in that time and in that day. Maybe it's a little out of sorts in our day. But it was, it was just a common expectation among the nation of Israel. I mean, if you cursed your father and your mother, right, in that day, <laughs> you know, there wasn't a lot of that going on. I was listening to some statistic. It was an old statistic. But it was uh, in the United States, there was like 8 million in one, it was one short time period. It was like 8 million assault attempts uh, just in the United States from children to their parents. That would not be the case in ancient Israel. You know what I mean? But like one assault attempt. You remember that guy? Yeah, don't be like that guy. <laughs> you know, that was the last one that, did. you know, he tried. But, uh, but that, th there was an expectation of honor. You know, that, that, that was the thing among the people. You know, his son would probably be probably following in his father's footsteps, taking up the family trade, and serving some way in the house. And, and God's using that. Hey, a son honors his father. And I'm considered a father. If I'm a father, where's my honor? A servant is a master. A servant is a master, you know. I mean, you look at people in workplaces, right? You know, you've seen the typical boss and the, and the worker, you know. I mean, if a boss is sitting there, sometimes I've seen bosses, you know, in situations, maybe I've done this as well, usually in a nicer way, but I've seen it in a harsh way, where a boss would be like, you know, how is that supposed to be done again? And they'll look at an employee, employees, you know, you know, try to get an order the way it's supposed to be. And if he doesn't, he may not be an employee anymore. <laughs> in ancient Israel, but no, but uh, <laughs> as long as they didn't lose enough. But uh, but no, the so there's there was an expectation. You know, oh, this is obvious. Like you know, servant to his master is going to be doing what he's supposed to do. Where's my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. Do you priests who despise my name? And again, the name, just the, the name. In that day, the connotation was fairly heavy, being the definition. Your name uh, attributed the, the your word. Uh, your character, your reputation. It's kind of centered upon your name. There was, there was a great gravity to it. And it says there, in response, it says, verse 7, you have offered defiled food on the altar. God continues on. But say, in what way have we defiled you? And the Lord says, by saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. So there was, uh, that, that word, Hebrew word is, Bazal, I think it is Bazal. That's the strongest concordance of what it says, which is, simply means to disesteem. So they're saying the table of the Lord is not to be esteemed. You know, uh, remember the table of the Lord speaking of the bread, table of showbread. There was, the, the, we talked about recently in Exodus, Exodus 25. You know, that stuff was basically not esteemed. You know, maybe they were just throwing bread up there instead of stacking it properly. I don't know exactly what they were doing. But it was not being esteemed. And, you know, the crossover, spiritual crossover, the bread, the picture of the body of Christ. You know, we take in communion, where we remember the body, that we esteem the body of Christ. It's a question for us. Now, verse 8, it says, And when you offer a blind, the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? So, I don't know how tough. It would probably be pretty tough. I imagine if you were a shepherd and you had like, say you got a hundred sheep over here, and then you got this one sheep that's just like like just like can't just follow you at all because it's blind. You know, it's about to run off the cliff. You're like, no, you know, trying to get this sheep to come in. You know what I'm gonna do with you? I'm gonna offer you to the Lord. <laughs> it's like it's blind sheep. That'll teach you the lesson that priest will cut his neck, right? But no, it's it's we see the prescriptions. God already had the prescriptions laid out for what these offerings should be in Leviticus and some of the, I've, I've 
went over this text myself on a Thursday about some of the sacrifices offered in the ordination ceremony with Aaron. There were some prescriptions there. And it says, and we're keeping on there, it says, and when you offer the lame and the sick, so we got the blind, the lame, and the sick, is it not evil? God's posing the question. Offer it then to the governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. Try doing that with the IRS, right? <laughs> if the currency is a $20 bill, would you rip it in half? Or rip the little blue strip out of it and hand it to Uncle Sam? Here's my taxes. Or write a fake check. You know, that would obviously not work. You know, Cyrus would, would, would you know, whether one of his close predecessors afterward would be potentially the governor. I mean, would you, would you offer something fake and phony? Or something that's decrepit or falling apart to him. And when he accepts you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. And this is uh, interesting, you know, you see in 2 Samuel 24, 24, how opposite, you know, they revered David as a king, but how opposite David's heart was in making a sacrifice. You know, it says, and the king said to him, or not, nay, I will surely buy this land for me or from a prize of Christ, neither will I give offering, burnt offerings unto the Lord my God, of that which doesn't have cost me nothing. So David brought the threshing for and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. So there was a chance that he was going to make a sacrifice and this guy was going to offer it to him for free. David's like, no, dude, I'm not offering something to the Lord that didn't cost me anything. There was that sense that, that this needed to be, you know, come from his earning something that come from him. You know, not just like, yeah, I'm the king. Yeah, just use your place. That'll work. No, it was, it, was, it was supposed to be some intention behind it. That was important. Verse 9, it says, But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this thing is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? I like this paraphrase of that verse. It says, Try to pacify God and win his favor? Question mark. How can he favor any one of you, says the Lord of hosts, when you offer him? such sacrifices. So they're kind of like saying, yeah, maybe God will be gracious to us. God's going to be just so grace, grace, grace. Yeah, it's the blind eye sheep. Yeah, it's the, you know, I was on the way over and chariot ran over a sheep and I picked it up and offered it to the Lord. You know, God's gracious. Aren't you gracious, Lord? Just going to look over at this thing. Verse 10 says, Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle a fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. It's better just to keep the temple door shut. You know, the way that you're coming to me and you're, you're giving, serving me, you know what, man? Just keep the door shut. And, you know, it can be said, I mean, you know, it's, it's not hard to, to make a spiritual crossover to, to consider, you know, for ourselves as we look at these things. I, I remember seasons in my life and in my walk with God where, you know, I wasn't giving the first fruit to my increase to God. I wasn't uh, looking at the best of what I had and thought, you know, this should go straight to the Lord. You know, there was more of a thought of, well, look at all these other responsibilities. And then God was somewhere like, you know, seventh, eighth, or ninth on the list, maybe, in my mind, when a resource came. And there's those things that as we as we come to God, as we come to God and look at what Jesus has done for us, you know, we should offer not just, you know, just you know, yes, we should offer you know, first fruits of our increase as that, and later Malachi touches more specifically on those things too. But there's that just offering your your whole your whole self to God. You offer your life as a living sacrifice, as Romans talk about. You know, beyond the fullness of what we transform and renew in your mind. You know, there's uh, there's that constant thing, especially in our culture. And I know in my own mind, where I need my mind to be washed in the water of the Word of God. 
and to hear the Lord's perspective on this thing. A really neat, yes, I know about this or I know about that, but you know what? It needs to get a little more rooted than what it's at right now. You know, because I still have those occasional wayward thoughts, right? <laughs> you know, somebody, you know, makes you upset or somebody makes you angry and start thinking other things or right? something's going to happen. Versus bringing that thought into submission, taking that thought captive and being obedient to the Lord. You know, it's a it's a sad thing that, you know, even in our day and age, you know, talk about shutting the doors of the temple, but in some cases, spiritually speaking, if the churches aren't really preaching the word of God, they're not willing, at least willing, I know we're all gonna fail in that willingness in some way, shape, or form. That's just a reality. And there is grace, I think, for that, like God's calling on Jacob's life, I think. We're calling the Lord. We're really trying to follow God and honor Him and bless Him and receive from Him. And that's, you know, there's a willingness there. But there's some places that aren't even willing to, to let the Word be taught. They're not willing to, to let certain things, um, people maybe even, you know, grow in their giftings or give it a place to serve in some way, shape, or form. And uh, in those places, it would probably be better if they shut the doors on us. If you're not going to honor God, or at least allow His Word to have full reign, at least be willing to hear what He has to say, at least be willing to do what He's called us to do accordingly, then the, it should be the door should be shut in places like that, right? Um, or this commentary said, commentary said, "More, I'm more afraid of profanity in God's house than on the streets." That was an interesting quote. So the last couple of verses here. Verse 11. It says, for the, From the rising of the sun, even to the going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles in every place. Incense shall be offered to my name. And a pure offering. God's saying this is going to go out and His name is going to be great among the Gentiles. I think it's a, in a prophetic sense. Uh, you know, I believe in a, in a spiritual, in a practical sense, Perhaps even in this day, in, in, in God's own way, this is as has, has happened. But you know, I definitely in a spiritual sense, in a future sense, and uh, you know, you can say the future sense in the terms of the millennial reign, where the third temple is supposedly to be brought in, and all nations will come in in that sense. Um, but we also can see this in the gospel. You know, Romans chapter eleven, verse twenty-five says this. It says. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Unfortunately, this is, you know, when Paul says you should not be ignorant of certain things, it's like, was it spiritual gifts? Uh, the mystery that we're going to talk about here in this verse in Romans 11, 25. And also talking about the rapture, I think, with Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. Don't be ignorant of these things. And what are the things people, and spiritual gifts, yeah. What are the things people most ignorant about? Those things. <laughs> you know, most ignorant, like, oh, spiritual gifts, mm, don't want to talk about that. You know, or rapture, sure, well, you don't want to take a position, you know. <laughs> the nation of Israel is what this verse talks about. Don't be ignorant of these things. Romans 11, 25, this mystery. Lest you be wise in your own opinion. So you don't get wise on your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So there is this proclamation. Paul further explains this in Romans 11. And it may be kind of a good thing if you're you know, wanting to get a full gist of the some of the calling and the election stuff. If you read Romans chapter 9, it talks about Israel's past. We alluded to that earlier as it related to Esau and that. Uh, Romans 10 is more of Israel's present. And Romans 11 is Israel's future. In a general sense, if you read those chapters, that kind of gives you some some, some uh, insight. And that's the you know, verse over there from Romans 11, 25. And that obviously, you know, speaks about in Revelation further down the line. I mean, you know, every tribe, every tongue, every kindred, it's going to be there before the throne. You know, quite a good question for us to see is, you know, what part have I prayed in or served in that capacity? You know, that's the thing I think of as I look at that. You know, he's praying, talking about praying through the nations. You know, we need to get back on that track as a church to the verse 12. Verse 12 says, But if you profane it, 
in that you say, The table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food, is contemptible. You also say, What a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you shall bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. In verse 14, But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. So is this ongoing thing continuing in this rebuke the Lord is giving that there's a mindset among the priests as they're serving apparently in the temple capacity and at the table that, that, that it's not to be esteemed. Again, we see that mentioned in verse 12. We already talked about it before. It's reiterated there. In verse 13, it's saying, Oh, what a weariness. Serving God. It's so weary. You know? It's so, so hard to serve the Lord. You know, there is a... Galatians 6, 9 says this, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. There's a weariness that can come upon us as we serve God. But if our heart, in our, in our, we're being led by God's Spirit, we're seeking to be faithful to the Lord, there's blessing if we do not, you know, we don't take our hand off the plow, we just keep plowing and doing as the Lord has instructed us to do. We continue to make disciples, we continue to do Bible study, we continue to take communion, we continue to disciple our wives continue to disciple our children. We continue to be a blessing to one another in the body of Christ here. As we continue to hold fast in those things, there's fruit that comes from that. So we shouldn't lose heart in that. And yet, the priest in this day, in Malachi's time, and I think in a lot of cases, you know, in our culture today, there's a, there is a weariness that takes place in people. You know, there's this phrase, they get burnt out. And there is a proper time for being spiritually rested. Let's understand that. Let's keep that into the equation. You know, and, and, and ministering, you know, in a, in a way that's where we got the priorities straight. You know, our family is the first ministry, spouse. Because God indicts them in the next chapter on this point. <laughs> but, you know, and then there's the ministry to the family. And there's ministry to the body. And, and obviously being abreast is an important part of that. But the uh, you know the thing that we see, I think, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago, I don't know if anybody remembered this, but I talked about Nahab and Abihu, how they offered a strange fire unto the Lord. And it was not supposed to be offered, and God literally burnt them out. <laughs> I mean, not taking it lightly, you know, they wrongly lit the thing, but they burnt, they were burnt out. And I do believe if our hearts are misaligned in our devotion to the Lord, if we're not really doing it as unto the Lord, because he, we're not doing it out of response of His love for us, realizing the first, He first loved us, we're not doing it out of response to that. Our hearts misalign. I think we can offer a strange fire to the Lord in our service and get burned out. Hopefully not like they have the Bible. But, <laughs> but you know, we'll get that sense of our hearts not in it. If we get our heart only focused. If I look at doing something around here and I'm thinking, man, I'm doing this for Pastor Dave. He is so not appreciating this. I wish he would have seen this. Who am I doing it for in that moment? Am I doing it for the Lord? Or am I doing it for Pastor Dave? Now he may have asked me to do it, but even so, do it as unto the Lord. Same way with the job, right? Your boss, I've had some hard things to talk to me about from not like the rare bosses, but people I interact with that have authority over their own whatever establishments and stores and they said difficult things to me. And I had no control over it. And I just had to submit. And I looked at it as like, you know what, Lord, this is the way you want it to handle. And once I stepped into that realization that, hey Lord, this is your your thing to handle, peace and fast and understanding just kept flowing. When we start stepping outside of that, it's easy to get burnt out. So, verse 14, it says, But curse be the deceiver. Or I think I read that. Mm -hmm. There's a flock in the mail. So that's the mindset there is, uh, is man, God's king. 
There's, there's the deceiver, the one that knows he has a good, the good offering. Yeah, that's the one the Lord should probably get. That's a really good one. We'll give out away. You know? <laughs> this is really an exhortation for the blessing room, right? <laughs> People that bring stuff in. Please quit bringing those giant TVs, people. <laughs> that they come in and bless them. But no, there's, there's, there's this thing, this thought that, you know, I know what God should be getting, but I'm not going to know that. And then pretending that's all you have. You know, I think of Acts chapter 5. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? That the, the story, you know, they, they caught wind of people bringing offerings to the Lord. Like, yeah, I'm going to bring some offering to the Lord. And most people were given, like, maybe their entire estate or whatever, or home. And they sell some property and they, well, I don't know, we kind of need this. You know, we'll give that to the Lord. And I think there was a pretense, a deception of what they were bringing to God. Making it look like it was something that it wasn't. And it was... They walked out, or they didn't walk out. <laughs> they were walked out <laughs> because of, they died on the spot. It was something that was the Lord was trying to establish. And He says here, "I'm a great King. I'm to be feared among the nations." One last scripture here, and we'll try to wrap up. You know, a couple of thoughts and prayer. You know, Matthew 10, 28 says Jesus says this. He says, "Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body." In hell. I ain't saying that's like a scare tactic. I'm just placing forward this realization of how we perceive God and perceive our service toward God in comparison to what we've seen tonight in some of these instances. You know? And it's not a judgment on any one of you as an individual. Uh, we're, you know, those children of God should be led by the Spirit of God, right? But, you know, allow God to take that authority in your home or in your life as a whole. He's the king and he's to be feared. You know, you know, we, we look at that boss and we'll straighten up and do the right thing when he walks onto the job scene. Whoa, 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 whoa. Just the right way, or driving down the road, you see the police officer. Whoa, whoa, whoa slow down. You know, <laughs> you know, but but I mean, who's that? Police officer, boss, except an authority that was established by the Lord in Romans 13. But but God, right? And I'm not talking about God in relation necessarily just to those things, and that's it. Could be for you, but you know, in relationship to the things that He teaches us in His Word. One of the things that I'm so grieved about. And I'm wrestling with it. You can pray for me about this, really. And I struggle with it is uh, a lot. Personally, maybe it's something the Lord's trying to weed out of me. Um, but is is this thought of Christians and not keeping their word? I'm just like baffled by this. Like like just you know, it's it's a plague of, of uh, you know, let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anything else beyond that is from the evil one. And it's, 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 I'm a miffed. I really am. I mean, like, like this, in our day and age, I really think that's one of the biggest things, I think, in our wor world where rhetoric is just, like, you know, on the up and up, constantly. Talk, 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 talk. And I think people get sucked into that. Talk, 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 talk. There's, like, diary of the mouth, motor mouth, you know? And it's like, you can tell I'm probably part of the bunch, right? But no, but, but there's that, just that sense of, like, People just do not mean what they say. They do not say what they mean. And they bear the name of Christ behind a lot of what they say and do. And I think it's 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 like we saw in this chapter in a lot of ways. Just that one thing. I mean, you know, much other the things we look at. But um, just some, just some, you know things to be considered. You know, as uh, as we see in this time, this last book of the Old Testament. Frivolous approach to the things of God once it's established. And I think that in and of itself is just a, it's a good warning to consider. You know, am I just kind of in the redundancy of the day to day? Or am I really hearing from God? Am I really listening to what He's trying to say? Am I passionately pursuing with the same fire, you know, that I had when I was first saved? Do I have that same 
sense in my, in my words and my thoughts and my actions towards the Lord. It's always a good place to revisit. You know, I remember that first love, right? So, I'm going to pray. Uh, and we've got one prayer request we'll talk about. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that uh, you desire to speak these things in our day to us. You, you lovingly and graciously do uh, condescend <laughs> to us through the Holy Spirit. You do give us that, that sense of calling, God, just like you gave to Jacob, that you've loved him. And Lord, we're in Christ because you love us in Christ. If we're in him, Lord, we're protected, we're shielded, we're blessed in so many ways. But Lord, we still wrestle just like uh, Rebecca wrestled with Jacob when he saw it in his stomach. We wrestle, uh, you know, in the flesh, in the spirit. You know, the Romans chapter 7, we're stuck sometimes in those decisions. Lord, please help us. You've given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Help us to, Lord, help, help our minds to be conformed to your word, your will, to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, Lord, as you direct our lives, to be the, the men we're called to be as, as, uh, as fathers, as husbands, as uh, workers, as servants in the body of Christ, Lord. Lord, that our whole heart, Lord, is surrendered to you. And all these things, God, that you would receive glory. Not that we would look to that guy and say, well, he's more wholehearted to me or whatever, but Lord, we would just look in, to you and know in our own walk and understanding and hearing from you that the Holy Spirit, that conviction of righteousness, yeah, you did what's right. Lord, you would just lead us in that. In our steps as we follow you, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.